Another day of visitors to the British Museum in London, and many of these people come to see other people, rather small ones. The Department of Prehistory and Europe contains a curious ensemble of diminutive figures. Staring out from behind glass are the carved faces of powerful kings, anxious queens, serene bishops, and fierce foot soldiers. They are wonderful sculptures in miniature. Everybody who sees them for the first time goes, ah. Just looking at each one of them, just the sheer craftsmanship, and it's all there. Power, gender, beauty, fear. They're only tiny, they're only a few inches tall, and yet they are so important. Their importance is out of all proportion to their size. When you look them direct in the eye, you see somehow contact across the centuries. They are almost alive, these chess pieces. I have always believed that in the darkness, after hours, they have conversations among themselves. These precious carved ivory chess pieces were discovered on the remote island of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. The exact date of the discovery is unknown, but they were first exhibited to the public in an Edinburgh gallery in 1831. The incredibly preserved Lewis chessmen number no less than 78 pieces. It's by far the largest collection of chess pieces that's ever been discovered anywhere in the medieval period. Sets don't turn up that often. Um, I've really, they've only been two discovered in my lifetime. And they are much more humble things. It's difficult to underestimate the significance of the Lewis chessmen. They're at the top of the tree. The Lewis chessmen's discovery remains shrouded in mystery and folklore. All that is known is that the pieces were found in a remote cove on the Lewis coast. One account states that a local peasant, Malcolm MacLeod, unearthed the hoard when his cow disturbed a sandbank to reveal the figures. And the story goes that he was frightened of them, he thought they were sprites or something like that. I can believe very readily that the um, reaction of the person who saw them for the first time in the ground was that they were little devils or sprites and that their instant reaction might have been fear. Archaeology was in its infancy when the pieces were found and so little was written at the time about the discovery. What is known is that they were found by accident. They are something of a fluke because you wouldn't dig in Lewis for a set of ivory chessmen, as a matter of course. I mean, as an archaeologist, I have to pay tribute to the chance discovery because they are really the best of all the chess pieces we've ever found. Not only was the Lewis hoard a remarkable one-off find, but later accounts mentioned the notion that the chess pieces were buried 15 foot down in a stone container. I think we can be sure that those chess pieces were buried. When you look at the chess pieces um, scientifically, as it were, there's quite a disparity in their preservation. Some look as if they're new, and some are rather the worse for wear and a bit crumbly, which suggests that they were in a subterranean cavern, and they certainly weren't washed up on the beach and lying around for all that time. What is known with some certainty is that the Lewis chessmen are about 800 years old. They present quite clear hallmarks of belonging to a certain time and culture. The mitres which the bishops wear are worn in a way that suggests a date after 1150, and we know this because of the date evidence provided by sealed documents, documents that are sealed with the image of a bishop. By 1150, it was established practice for bishops to wear their mitres pointing towards the front of the head. Before then, the vogue was to wear them from side to side. 
All of the Lewis bishops, and there are 16 of them in all, display this change in ecclesiastical fashion. The Lewis chess pieces are sophisticated examples of the artistic and cultural movement of the Middle Ages, known as the Romanesque. It describes a particular flourishing of the arts, um, which is based on a reappraisal of classical knowledge. The way it's interpreted architecturally is for round arches based on Roman models which are introduced into the cathedrals of Europe. And these are represented in miniature on the backs of the thrones of some of the characters in the Lewis chess pieces. When the chessmen were discovered in the 19th century, it was assumed that they were made on the Isle of Lewis itself. No one believes this now. The most popular candidate for their birthplace is Scandinavia, and most of all, Norway. There are stylistic comparisons with church carvings in Norway. There are individual finds of uh, pieces in Scandinavia which relate very closely to the Lewis chessmen. The closest comparisons to Scandinavian art are really offered when we turn the pieces over and ins inspect the thrones that they sit on, um, where we find this proliferation of um, foliate motifs and lots of zoomorphic ornamentation. And this is very typical of the period and very typical of the Scandinavian love of ornament at this time. A similar type of decoration to the thrones of some of the Lewis pieces is evident on the intricately carved surface of an ivory reliquary. This is also in the British Museum. It was carved in Scandinavia from a whole walrus tusk. And this is the material from which the Lewis chessmen were also made. They're made of walrus ivory, which at the time was the only ivory you could get in the northern world. This helps to place where they were made because we know that the walrus came from Greenland to Norway and that the most likely place for the Lewis chessmen to be made would be Trondheim. I think a generation ago we believed that the Lewis chessmen were made in England, but we now know rather better than that. If you look at them now, you think, that's not English, that's Scandinavian. The northwestern coast of Norway was the centre of the walrus ivory trade in the 12th century. In this period there was a shortage of elephant ivory, which was highly prized. Walrus tusk was the alternative, and was therefore in great demand. We don't know a great deal about the quantity of walrus that was coming down from Greenland, but we do know that it was very, very difficult to hunt for it. Now that would be done in the summer where conditions would still be awful and where it was very hazardous and very difficult. And that material then would have to come hundreds, if not thousands of miles, down to its end destination. So you really weren't going to waste any of this uh, walrus ivory if you got hold of it. Trondheim also had a concentration of highly skilled craftsmen capable of handling such a precious raw material. But making the chessmen would not have been their ordinary line of work. This would have been a dream commission, really. And it's likely that it's the same sort of people that ordinarily would have made much more mundane things and, in fact, probably wouldn't have made a lot out of walrus ivory. They'd have been using bone and antler to make things like hair combs and pins and really everyday objects, but it still meant that a workshop suddenly had to produce something of great quality, which clearly they were up to doing. Producing the Lewis chessmen out of walrus tusk was no easy task. It took great skill and patience to manipulate such a temperamental organic material. One of the few craftsmen in Britain who is custodian to this age-old knowledge of ivory carving is Dave Hodgson. You couldn't afford to make mistakes because it was so expensive. You know, you wouldn't have wasted any, not even the scrap. This is antique elephant ivory. On any kind of ivory, whether it's elephant or walrus, you have the, a root canal which leaves you with a hollow piece which limits the actual things you can make out of it. It has got a grain structure and it can split. The skill involved in making it, I mean, it's hard enough to do with using power tools to actually do it with just a little bone drill and um, a couple of chisels and a knife, it's just, just absolutely amazing. 
The total of 78 chess pieces found on Lewis contained eight kings, enough for four potential sets. The game of chess involves two sides of 16 pieces, 32 in a complete set. So the four sets found on Lewis would have originally numbered a full 128 pieces when first carved. Just doing the one or two pieces that I've made has took nearly three days, so I wouldn't like to hazard a guess how long it takes to do 120 odd pieces. The craftsman would initially work out which chess piece would come from which part of the tusk, allowing for its natural curvature. It's thought it would probably have taken six tusks from three walruses to make a single full set of chess pieces. Each section of tusk would then be sawn and roughly shaped by an apprentice. The master craftsman in the workshop would then finish off the detailed carving. Once a first chess piece was carved, it would act as a template for all the others of the same rank. That workshop would have needed a reference in order to produce them. If it's a workshop that's simply making combs and pins and so on, then it's not making chess pieces very often. It needs to know what these pieces look like. So someone is taking perhaps a pattern book or a pattern set and using that, but incorporating also elements of the modern world of the 12th century into that set and bringing them up to date. So you could have had, in effect, a blueprint for a chess set, but with alterations for a patron's taste. There is no doubt that the Lewis chessmen display a Romanesque Scandinavian style. It's more debatable whether the signature of an individual artist is detectable. But their design is functional. They are meant to be used as gaming pieces, not just as ornaments. It's actually when you pick them up and handle them that you realise just how wonderfully they're designed. If you're playing a game of chess, there's movement over the board. You want pieces that will actually stand their ground, that have a low centre of gravity, that aren't easily knocked over, that, that won't be easily damaged. And the artist has made sure that there, there's an inherent protection there and that there are no protuberant parts. None of the pieces have necks. They have slightly hunched shoulders. They're very solid. The crooks of the bishops don't protrude in any way. The swords that the kings hold are placed on their knees securely. None of these things can easily be knocked off. In fact, you've got to try quite hard to damage them. Part of their huge appeal to a modern audience is the almost comic appearance that many of the pieces display. You have this rook here, and he's on guard. But in fact, he's looking somewhere far over there, not concentrating, daydreaming, I think. There wasn't much outlet for an artist to put something personal in, but with these chess pieces, I think they went to town and probably really enjoyed making them. The design of the Lewis chessmen has its roots in the origin of the game itself. The rules of chess have remained largely unchanged since its beginnings as an Indian war game around 600 AD. But the design of the pieces themselves underwent a radical evolution as chess was introduced into Europe a thousand years ago. Well, chess reached the medieval west from the Islamic world, so most of the pieces, perhaps not all of them, but most of them were non-representational. They, they were geometric-looking objects, so you could read almost whatever meaning you wanted into them. So the, the move stayed the same as chess moved across cultural frontiers, but the pieces changed their shape as they came. The Lewis chessmen mark an important stage in the westernization of chess. Their appearance is inseparable from the culture in which they were made. The progression from abstract pieces to figurative isn't linear. Although abstract pieces were used at the same time as figurative pieces, what's important about the Lewis chessmen is that they represent human form, and that's one of their endearing qualities. European chess continued to be a game won or lost with the capture of the king. Chessmen known as the Salerno pieces, now kept in Paris, predate the Lewis chessmen by about 70 years. They are an interesting hybrid. Some of the pieces are still depicted as elephants and chariots, alongside figures of kings and queens. The Lewis pieces really represent the end.